An Unexpected Result by Edward P. Rowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Like Many Waters. An Unexpected Result. Jack, she played with me deliberately, heartlessly. I can never forgive her. In that case, Will, I congratulate you. Such a girl isn't worth a second thought, and you've made a happy escape. No congratulations, if you please. You can talk coolly, because in regard to such matters you are cool, and, I may add, a trifle cold. Ambition is your mistress, and a musty law-book has more attractions for you than any woman living. I'm not so tempered. I am subject to the general law of nature, and a woman's love and sympathy are essential to success in my life and work. That's all right, but there are as good fish. Oh, have done with your trite nonsense, interrupted Will Munson impatiently. I consult you on a point of law in preference to most of the graybeards, but I was a fool to speak of this affair. And yet, as my most intimate friend, come, Will, I'm not unfeeling. And John Ackland rose and put his hand on his friend's shoulder. I admit that the subject is remote from my line of thought and wholly beyond my experience. If the affair is so serious, I shall take it to heart serious is it a slight thing to be crippled for life oh come now said ackland giving his friend a hearty and encouraging thump you are sound in mind and limb what matters a scratch on the heart to a man not twenty-five very well i'll say no more about it when i need a lawyer i'll come to you good-bye i sail for brazil in the morning will sit down and look me in the eyes said ackland decisively Will, forgive me, you are in trouble. A man's eyes usually tell me more than all his words, and I don't like the expression of yours. There is yellow fever in Brazil. I know it, was the careless reply. What excuse have you for going? Business complications have arisen there, and I promptly volunteered to go. My employers were kind enough to hesitate and warn me, and to say that they could send a man less valuable to them, but I soon overcame their objections. That is your excuse for going, the reason I see in your eyes. You are reckless, Will. I have reason to be. I can't agree with you, but I feel for you all the same. Tell me all about it, for this is sad news to me. I had hoped to join you on the beach in a few days, and to spend August with you and my cousin. I confess I am beginning to feel exceedingly vindictive toward this pretty little monster, and if any harm comes to you I shall be savage enough to scalp her. The harm has come already, Jack. I'm hit hard. She showed me a mirage of happiness that has made my present world a desert. I am reckless. I am desperate. You may think it is weak and unmanly, but you don't know anything about it. Time or the fever may cure me, but now I am bankrupt in all that gives value to life. A woman with an art so consummate that it seemed artless deliberately evoked the best there was in me, then threw it away as indifferently as a cast-off glove. Tell me how it came about. How can I tell you? How can I in cold blood recall glances, words, intonations, the pressure of a hand that seemed alive with reciprocal feeling? In addition to her beauty, she had the irresistible charm of fascination. I was weary at first, but she angled for me with a skill that would have disarmed any man who did not believe in the inherent falseness of woman. The children in the house idolize her, and I have great faith in a child's intuitions. Oh, that was only part of her guile, said Ackland frowningly. Probably. At any rate, she has taken all the color and zest out of my life. I wish someone could pay her back in her own coin. I don't suppose she has a heart, but I wish her vanity might be wounded in a way that would teach her a lesson never to be forgotten. It certainly would be a well-deserved retribution, said Ackland musingly. Jack, you are the one of all the world to administer the punishment. I don't believe a woman's smiles ever quickened your pulse one beat. You are right, Will. It is my cold-bloodedness to put your thought in plain English that will prove your best ally. I only hope that I am not leading you into danger. You will need an Indian stoicism. Bah! I may fail ignominiously and find her vanity invulnerable, but I pledge you my word that I will avenge you if it be within the compass of my skill. My cousin Mrs. Alston may prove a useful ally. I think you wrote me that the name of this siren was Eva Van Tyne. Yes, I only wish she had the rudiments of a heart, so that she might feel in a faint, far-off way a little of the pain she has inflicted on me. Don't let her make you falter or grow remorseful, Jack. Remember that you have given a pledge to one who may be dead before you can fulfill it. Ackland said farewell to his friend with the fear that he might never see him again, 
and a few days later found himself at a New England seaside resort with a relentless purpose lurking in his dark eyes. Mrs. Alston did unconsciously prove a useful ally, for her wealth and elegance gave her unusual prestige in the house, and in joining her party Ackland achieved immediately all the social recognition he desired. While strolling with this lady on the piazza he observed the object of his quest, and was at once compelled to make more allowance than he had done hitherto for his friend's discomfiture. Two or three children were leaning over the young girl's chair, and she was amusing them by some clever caricatures. She was not so interested, however, but that she soon noted the newcomer, and bestowed upon him from time to time curious and furtive glances. That these were not returned seemed to occasion her some surprise, for she was not accustomed to be so utterly ignored, even by a stranger. A little later Ackland saw her consulting the hotel register. "'I have at least awakened her curiosity,' he thought. "'I've been waiting for you to ask me who that pretty girl is,' said Mrs. Alston, laughing." you do indeed exceed all men in indifference to women i know all about that girl was the grim reply she has played the very deuce with my friend munson yes replied mrs alston indignantly it was the most shameful piece of coquetry i ever saw she is a puzzle to me to the children and the old people in the house she is consideration and kindness itself but she appears to regard men of your years as legitimate game and is perfectly remorseless so beware she is dangerous invulnerable as you imagine yourself to be she will practice her wiles upon you if you give her half a chance and her art has much more than her pretty face to enforce it she is unusually clever ackland's slight shrug was so contemptuous that his cousin was nettled and she thought i wish the girl could disturb his complacent equanimity just a little it vexes one to see a man so indifferent it's a slight to woman and she determined to give Miss Van Tyne the vantage ground of an introduction at the first opportunity. And this occurred before the evening was over. To her surprise, Ackland entered into an extended conversation with the enemy. Well, she thought, if he begins in this style, there will soon be another victim. Miss Van Tyne can talk to as bright a man as he is and hold her own. Meanwhile, she will assail him in a hundred covert ways. Out of regard for his friend, he should have shown some disapproval of her, but there he sits, quietly talking in the publicity of the parlor. "'Mrs. Alston,' said a friend at her elbow, "'you ought to forewarn your cousin and tell him of Mr. Munson's fate.' "'He knows all about Mr. Munson,' was her reply. "'Indeed, the latter is his most intimate friend. I suppose my cousin is indulging in a little natural curiosity concerning this destroyer of masculine peace, and if ever a man could do so in safety, he can.' why so well i never knew so unsusceptible a man with the exception of a few of his relatives he has never cared for ladies society mrs alston was far astray in supposing that curiosity was ackland's motive in his rather prolonged conversation with miss van tyne it was simply part of his tactics for he proposed to waste no time in skirmishing or in guarded and gradual approaches he would cross weapons at once and secure his object by a sharp and aggressive campaign his object was to obtain immediately some idea of the caliber of the girl's mind, and in this respect he was agreeably surprised. For while giving little evidence of thorough education, she was unusually intelligent and exceedingly quick in her perceptions. He soon learned that she was gifted with more than woman's customary intuition, that she was watching his face closely for meanings that he did not choose to express in words, or else to conceal by his language while he feared that his task would be far more difficult than he expected and that he would have to be extremely guarded in order not to reveal his design he was glad to learn that the foe was worthy of his steel meanwhile her ability and self-reliance banished all compunction he had no scruples in humbling the pride of a woman who was at once so proud so heartless and so clever nor would the effort be wearisome for she had proved herself both amusing and interesting he might enjoy it quite as much as an intricate law case. Even prejudiced Ackland, as he saw her occasionally on the following day, was compelled to admit that she was more than pretty. Her features were neither regular nor faultless, her mouth was too large to be perfect, and her nose was not Grecian. But her eyes were peculiarly fine, and illumined her face, whose chief charm lay in its power of expression. If she chose, almost all her thoughts and feelings could find their reflex there. The trouble was that she could as readily mask her thought and express what she did not feel. Her eyes were of the darkest blue, and her hair seemed light in contrast. 
It was evident that she had studied Grace so thoroughly that her manner and carriage appeared unstudied and natural. She ever seemed self-conscious, and yet no one had ever seen her in an ungainly posture or had known her to make an awkward gesture. This Grace, however, like a finished style in writing, was tinged so strongly with her own individuality that it appeared original as compared with the fashionable monotony which characterized the manners of so many of her age she could not have been much more than twenty and yet as mrs alston took pains to inform her cousin she had long been in society adding its homage is her breath of life and from all i hear your friend munson has had many predecessors be on your guard your solicitude in my behalf is quite touching he replied who is this fair buccaneer that has made so many wrecks and exacts so heavy a revenue from society who has the care of her and what are her antecedents she is an orphan and possessed i am told of considerable property in her own name a forceless nerveless maiden aunt is about the only antecedent we see much of her guardian has been here once or twice but practically she is independent miss van tyne's efforts to learn something concerning ackland were apparently quite as casual and indifferent and yet were made with utmost skill she knew that mrs alston's friend was something of a gossip and she led her to speak of the subject of her thoughts with an indirect finesse that would have amused the young man exceedingly could he have been an unobserved witness when she learned that he was mr munson's intimate friend and that he was aware of her treatment of the latter she was somewhat disconcerted one so forewarned might not become an easy prey but the additional fact that he was almost a woman-hater put her upon her mettle at once and she felt that here was a chance for a conquest such as she had never made before she now believed that she had discovered the key to his indifference he was ready enough to amuse himself with her as a clever woman but knew her too well to bestow upon her even a friendly thought if i can bring him to my feet it will be a triumph indeed she murmured exultantly and at my feet he shall be if he gives me half a chance seemingly he gave her every chance that she could desire and while he scarcely made an effort to seek her society she noted with secret satisfaction that he often appeared as if accidentally near her and that he ever made it the easiest and most natural thing in the world for her to join him his conversation was often as gay and unconventional as she could wish but she seldom failed to detect in it an uncomfortable element of satire and irony he always left her dissatisfied with herself and with a depressing consciousness that she had made no impression upon him his conquest grew into an absorbing desire and she unobtrusively brought to bear upon him every art and fascination that she possessed her toilets were as exquisite as they were simple the children were made to idolize her more than ever but ackland was candid enough to admit that this was not all guile on her part for she was evidently in sympathy with the little people who can rarely be imposed upon by any amount of false interest indeed he saw no reason to doubt that she abounded in good nature toward all except the natural objects of her ruling passion but the very skill and deliberateness with which she sought to gratify this passion greatly increased his vindictive feeling he saw how naturally and completely his friend had been deceived and how exquisite must have been the hopes and anticipations so falsely raised therefore he smiled more grimly at the close of each succeeding day and was more than ever bent upon the accomplishment of his purpose at length miss van tyne changed her tactics and grew quite oblivious to ackland's presence in the house but she found him apparently too indifferent to observe the fact she then permitted one of her several admirers to become devoted ackland did not offer to protest of even a glance he stood as it were just where she had left him ready for an occasional chat stroll or excursion if the affair came about naturally and without much effort on his part she found that she could neither induce him to seek her nor annoy him by an indifference which she meant should be more marked than his own some little time after there came a windy day when the surf was so heavy that there were but few bathers ackland was a good swimmer and took his plunge as usual he was leaving the water when miss van tyne ran down the beach and was about to dart through the breakers in her wonted fearless style be careful he said to her the undertow is strong and the man who has charge of the bathing is ill and not here the tide is changing in fact running out already i believe but she would not even look at him much less answer as there were other gentlemen present he started for his bath-house but had proceeded but a little way up the beach before a cry brought him to the water's edge instantly 
"'Something is wrong with Miss Van Tyne,' cried half a dozen voices. "'She ventured out recklessly, and it seems as if she couldn't get back.' At that moment her form rose on the crest of a wave, and above the thunder of the surf came her faint cry, "'Help!' The other bathers stood irresolute, for she was dangerously far out, and the tide had evidently turned. Ackland, on the contrary, dashed through the breakers, and then, in his effort for speed, dived through the waves nearest to the shore. When he reached the place where he expected to find her, he saw nothing for a moment or two but great crested billows that every moment were increasing in height under the rising wind. For a moment he feared that she had perished, and the thought that the beautiful creature had met her death so suddenly and awfully made him almost sick and faint. An instant later, however, a wave threw her up from the trough of the sea into full vision somewhat on his right, and a few strong strokes brought him to her side. "'Oh, save me!' she gasped. "'Don't cling to me,' he said sternly. "'Do as I bid you. Strike out for the shore if you are able. If not, lie on your back and float.' She did the latter, for now that aid had reached her, she apparently recovered from her panic and was perfectly tractable. He placed his left hand under her and struck out quietly, aware that the least excitement causing exhaustion on his part might cost both of them their lives. As they approached the shore, a rope was thrown to them, and Ackland, who felt his strength giving way, seized it desperately. He passed his arm around his companion with a grasp that almost made her breathless, and they were dragged half-suffocated through the water until strong hands on either side rushed them through the breakers. Miss Van Tyne for a moment or two stood dazed and panting, then disengaged herself from the rather warm support of the devoted admirer whom she had tried to play against Ackland, and tried to walk, but after a few uncertain steps fell senseless on the sand, thus for the moment drawing to herself the attention of the increasing throng. Ackland, glad to escape notice, was staggering off to his bathhouse, when several ladies, more mindful of his part in the affair than the men had been, overtook him with a fire of questions and plaudits. "'Please, leave me alone,' he said almost savagely, without looking around. "'What a bear he is! Anyone else would have been a little complacent over such an exploit,' they chorused, as they followed the unconscious girl, who was now being carried to the hotel. Ackland locked the door of his little apartment and sank panting on the bench. "'Maledictions on her,' he muttered. "'At one time there was a better chance of her being fatal to me than to Munson with his yellow fever tragedy in prospect. Her recklessness to-day was perfectly insane. If she tries it again she may drown for all that I care, or at least I ought to care.' His anger appeared to act like a tonic, and he was soon ready to return to the house. A dozen sprang forward to congratulate him, but they found such impatience and annoyance at all reference to the affair that, with many surmises, the topic was dropped. "'You are a queer fellow,' remarked his privileged cousin, as he took her out to dinner. "'Why don't you let people speak naturally about the matter, or rather, why don't you pose as the hero of the occasion?' "'Because the whole affair was most unnatural, and I am deeply incensed. "'In a case of necessity I am ready to risk my life, although it has unusual attractions for me, "'but I'm no melodramatic hero looking for adventures. "'What necessity was there in this case? "'It is the old story of Munson over again in another guise.' The act was that of an inconsiderate, heartless woman who follows her impulses and inclinations, no matter what may be the consequences. After a moment he added, less indignantly, I must give her credit for one thing, angry as I am. She behaved well in the water, otherwise she would have drowned me. She is not a fool. Most women would have drowned you. She is indeed not a fool, therefore she's more to blame. If she is ever so reckless again, may I be asleep in my room. Of course one can't stand by and see a woman drown, no matter who or what she is. Jack, what made her so reckless? Mrs. Alston asked, with a sudden intelligence lighting up her face. Hang it all, how should I know? What made her torture Munson? She follows her impulses, and they are not always conductive to anyone's well-being, not even her own. Mark my words, she has never shown this kind of recklessness before. "'Oh, yes, she has. She was running her horse to death the other hot morning and nearly trampled on a child.' And he told of an unexpected encounter while he was taking a rather extended ramble. "'Well,' exclaimed Mrs. Alston, smiling significantly, "'I think I understand her symptoms better than you do. If you are as cold-blooded as you seem, I may have to interfere.' "'Oh, bah!' he answered impatiently. "'Pardon me, but I should despise myself forever should I become sentimental knowing what I do.' "'Jack, had you no compunctions when fearing that such a beautiful girl might perish? "'We are going to have an awful night. 
Hear the wind whistle and moan, and the sky is already black with clouds. The roar of the surface grows louder every hour. Think of that lovely form being out in those black, angry waves, darted at and preyed upon by horrible, slimy monsters. Oh, it fairly makes my flesh creep. And mine, too, he said, with a strong gesture of disgust, especially when I remember that I should have kept her company, for, of course, I could not return without her. I confess that when at first I could not find her, I was fairly sick at the thought of her fate, but remember how uncalled for it all was, quite as much so as that poor Will Munson on his way to die with a yellow fever like enough. Jack, said his cousin affectionately, laying her hand on his arm, blessings on your courage to-day. If what might have happened so easily had occurred, I could never have looked upon the sea again without a shudder. I should have been tormented by a horrible memory all my life. It was brave and noble. Oh, hush, he said angrily. I won't hear another word about it, even from you. I'm not brave and noble. I went because I was compelled to go. I hated to go. I hate the girl, and I have more reason now than ever. If we had both drowned, no doubt there would have been less trouble in the world. There would have been one lawyer the less, and a coquette extinguished. Now we shall both prey on society in our different ways indefinitely. Jack, you are in an awful mood to-day. I am. Never was in a worse. Having so narrowly escaped death, you ought to be subdued and grateful. On the contrary, I'm inclined to profanity. Excuse me. Don't wish any dessert. I'll try a walk and a cigar. You will now be glad to get rid of me on any terms. "'Stay, Jack. See, Miss Van Tyne is so far recovered as to come down. She looked unutterable things at you as she entered.' "'Of course she did. Very few of her thoughts concerning me or other young men would sound well if uttered. Tell your friends to let this topic alone, or I shall be rude to them.' And without a glance toward the girl he had rescued, he left the dining-room. "'Well, well,' murmured Mrs. Alston. "'I never saw Jack in such a mood before. It is as quite unaccountable as Miss Van Tyne's recklessness.' I wonder what is the matter with him. Ackland was speedily driven back from his walk by the rain, which fact he did not regret, for he found himself exhausted and depressed. Seeking a retired piazza in order to be alone, he sat down with his hat drawn over his eyes and smoked furiously. Before very long, however, he was startled out of a painful reverie by a timid voice, saying, Mr. Ackland, won't you permit me to thank you? He rose. Miss Van Tyne stood before him with outstretched hand. He did not notice it, but bowing coldly, said, "'Please consider that you have thanked me and let the subject drop.' "'Do not be so harsh with me,' she pleaded. "'I cannot help it if you are. Mr. Ackland, you saved my life.' "'Possibly.' "'And possibly you think that it is scarcely worth saving.' "'Possibly your own conscience suggested that thought to you.' "'You are heartless,' she burst out indignantly. He began to laugh. "'That's a droll charge for you to make,' he said." She looked at him steadfastly for a moment, and then murmured, "'You are thinking of your friend, Mr. Munson.' "'That would be quite natural. How many more can you think of?' "'You are indeed unrelenting,' she faltered, tears coming into her eyes. "'But I cannot forget that but for you I should now be out there.' She indicated the sea by a gesture, then covered her face with her hands and shuddered. "'Do not feel under obligations. I should have been compelled to do as much for any human being.' You seem to forget that I stood an even chance of being out there with you, and that there was no more need of the risk than there was that my friend's life should be blight. You, you out there, she cried, springing toward him and pointing to the sea. Certainly, you cannot suppose that having once found you, I could come ashore without you. As it was, my strength was rapidly giving way, and were it not for the rope. Oh, forgive me, she cried passionately, seizing his hand in spite of him. It never entered my mind that you could drown. I somehow felt that nothing could harm you. I was reckless. I didn't know what I was doing. I don't understand myself any more. Please, please forgive me, or I shall not sleep to-night. Certainly, he said lightly, if you will not refer to our little episode again. Please don't speak in that way, she sighed, turning away. I have complied with your request. I suppose I must be content, she resumed sadly. Then, turning her head slowly toward him, she added hesitatingly, "'Will you forgive me for, for treating your friend?' "'No,' he replied, with such stern emphasis that she shrank from him and trembled. "'You are indeed heartless,' she faltered, and she turned to leave him. "'Miss Van Tyne,' he said indignantly, "'twice you have charged me with being heartless. Your voice and manner indicate that I would be unnatural and unworthy of respect were I what you charge. In the name of all that's rational, what does this word heartless mean to you?' 
where was your heart when you sent my friend away so wretched and humbled that he is virtually seeking death from which you are glad to escape i did not love him she protested faintly he laughed bitterly and continued love that's a word which i believe has no meaning for you at all but it had for him you are a remarkably clever woman miss van tyne you have brains in abundance see i do you justice what is more you are beautiful and can be so fascinating that a man who believed in you might easily worship you you made him believe in you you tried to beguile me into a condition that with my nature would be ruin indeed you never had the baby plea of a silly shallow woman i took pains to find that out the first evening we met in your art of beguiling an honest trusting man you were as perfect as you were remorseless and you understood exactly what you were doing for a time she seemed overwhelmed by his lava-like torrent of words and stood with bowed head and shrinking trembling form but when he ceased she turned to him and said bitterly and emphatically i did not understand what i was doing nor would my brain have taught me were i all intellect like yourself i half wish you had left me to drown and with a slight despairing gesture she turned away and did not look back ackland's face lighted up with a sudden flash of intelligence and deep feeling he started to recall her hesitated and watched her earnestly until she disappeared then looking out on the scowling ocean he took off his hat and exclaimed in a deep low tone by all that's divine can this be is it possible that through the suffering of her own awakening heart she is learning to know the pain she has given to others should this be true the affair is taking an entirely new aspect and munson will be avenged as neither of us ever dreamed would be possible he resumed his old position and thought long and deeply then rejoined his cousin who was somewhat surprised to find that his bitter mood had given place to his former composure how is this jack she asked as the storm grows wilder without you become more serene only trying to make amends for my former bearishness he said carelessly but with a little rising color i don't understand you at all she continued discontentedly i saw you sulking in that out-of-the-way corner and i saw miss van tyne approach you hesitatingly and timidly with the purpose no doubt of thanking you of course i did not stay to watch but a little later i met miss van tyne and she looked white and rigid she has not left her room since you take a great interest in miss van tyne it is well you are not in my place i half wish i was and had your chances you are more pitiless than the waves from which you saved her i can't help being just what i am he said coldly good night and he too disappeared for the rest of the evening the rain continued to fall in blinding torrents and the building fairly trembled under the violence of the wind the guests drew together in the lighted rooms and sought by varied amusements to pass the time until the fierceness of the storm abated few caring to retire while the uproar of the elements was so great at last the storm passed away and the late rising moon threw a sickly gleam on the tumultuous waters eva looked from her window with sleepless eyes thinking sadly and bitterly of the past and future suddenly a dark figure appeared on the beach in the track of the moonlight she snatched an opera glass but could not recognize the solitary form the thought would come however that it was ackland and if it were what were his thoughts and what place had she in them why was he watching so near the spot that might have been their burial place at least he shall not think that i can stolidly sleep after what has occurred she thought and she turned up her light opened her window and sat down by it again whoever the unseasonable rambler might be he appeared to recognize the gleam from her window for he walked hastily down the beach and disappeared after a time she darkened her room again and waited in vain for his return if it were he he shuns even the slightest recognition she thought despairingly and the early dawn was not far distant when she fell into an unquiet sleep for the next few days miss van tyne was a puzzle to all except mrs alston she was quite unlike the girl she had formerly been and she made no effort to disguise the fact in the place of her old exuberance of life and spirits there was lassitude and great depression the rich color ebbed steadily from her face and dark lines under her eyes betokened sleepless nights she saw the many curious glances in her direction but apparently did not care what was thought or surmised were it not that her manner to ackland was so misleading the tendency to couple their names together would have been far more general she neither sought nor shunned his society in fact she treated him as she did the other gentlemen of her acquaintance she took him at his word he had said he would forgive her on condition that she would not speak of what he was pleased to term that little episode 
and she never referred to it. Her aunt was as much as fault as the others, and one day querulously complained to Mrs. Alston that she was growing anxious about Eva. At first I thought she was disappointed over the indifference of that icy cousin of yours, but she does not appear to care a straw for him. When I mention his name, she speaks of him in a natural, graceful way, then her thoughts appear to wander off to some matter that is troubling her. I can't find out whether she is ill or whether she has heard some bad news of which she will not speak. She never gave me or any one that I know of much of her confidence. Mrs. Alston listened, but made no comments. She was sure she was right in regard to Miss Van Tyne's trouble. But her cousin mystified her. Ackland had become perfectly inscrutable. As far as she could judge by any word or act of his, he had simply lost his interest in Miss Van Tyne, and that was all that could be said. And yet a fine instinct tormented Mrs. Alston with the doubt that this was not true, and that the young girl was the subject of a sedulously concealed scrutiny. Was he watching for his friend or for his own sake, or was he, in a spirit of retaliation, enjoying the suffering of one who had made others suffer? His reserve was so great that she could not pierce it and his caution baffled even her vigilance. But she waited patiently, assured that the little drama must soon pass into a more significant phase. And she was right. Miss Van Tyne could not maintain the line of action she had resolved upon. She had thought, I won't try to appear happy when I am not. I won't adopt the conventional mask of gaiety when the heart is wounded. How often I have seen through it and smiled at the transparent farce, farce it seemed then but i now fear it was often tragedy at any rate there was neither dignity nor deception in it i have done with being false and so shall simply act myself and be a true woman though my heart break a thousand times not even by a glance shall i show that it is breaking for him if he or others surmise the truth they may let them it is a part of my penance and i will show the higher stronger pride of one who makes no vain useless pretense to happy indifference but who can maintain a self-control so perfect that even Mrs. Alston shall not see one unmaidenly advance or overture. She succeeded for a time, as we have seen, but she overrated her will and underrated her heart, that with deepening intensity craved the love denied her. With increasing frequency she said to herself, I must go away. My only course is to hide my weakness and never see him again. He is inflexible, yet his very obduracy increases my love a hundredfold. At last, after a lonely walk on the beach, she concluded, My guardian must take me home on Monday. He comes to-night to spend Sunday with us, and I will make preparations to go at once. Although her resolution did not fail her, she walked forward more and more slowly, her dejection and weariness becoming almost overpowering. As she was turning a sharp angle of rocks that jutted well down to the water, she came face to face with Ackland and Mrs. Alston. She was off her guard, and her thoughts of him had been so absorbing that she felt he must be conscious of them. She flushed painfully, and hurried by with slight recognition and downcast face. But she had scarcely passed them when, acting under a sudden impulse, she stopped and said in a low tone, "'Mr. Ackland.' He turned expectantly toward her. For a moment she found it difficult to speak, then ignoring the presence of Mrs. Alston resolutely began— Mr. Ackland, I must refer once more to a topic which you have in a sense forbidden. I feel partially absolved, however, for I do not think that you have forgiven me anything. At any rate, I must ask your pardon once more for having so needlessly and foolishly imperiled your life. I say these words now because I may not have another opportunity. We leave on Monday. With this she raised her eyes to his with an appeal for a little kindness which Mrs. Alston was confident could not be resisted. Indeed, she was sure that she saw a slight nervous tremor in Ackland's hands, as if he found it hard to control himself. Then he appeared to grow rigid. Lifting his hat, he said gravely and unresponsively, Miss Van Tyne, you now surely have made ample amends. Please forget the whole affair. She turned from him at once, but not so quickly, but that both he and his cousin saw the bitter tears that would come. A moment later she was hidden by the angle of the rock. As long as she was visible, Ackland watched her without moving. Then he slowly turned to his cousin, his face as inscrutable as ever. She walked at his side for a few moments in ill-concealed impatience, then stopped and said decisively, I'll go no further with you today. I am losing all respect for you. Without speaking, he turned to accompany her back to the house. His reticence and coldness appeared to annoy her beyond endurance, for she soon stopped and sat down on a ledge of the rocks that jutted down the beach where they had met Miss Van Tyne. 
"'John, you are the most unnatural man I ever saw in my life,' she began angrily. "'What reason have you for so flattering an opinion?' he asked coolly. "'You have been giving reason for it every day since you came here,' she resumed hotly. "'I always heard it said that you had no heart, but I defended you and declared that your course toward your mother, even when a boy, showed that you had, and that you would prove it some day. But now I believe that you are unnaturally cold, heartless, and unfeeling. I had no objection to your wounding Miss Van Tyne's vanity, and encouraged you when that alone bid fair to suffer. But then she proved she had a heart, and that you had awakened it. She deserved at least kindness and consideration on your part. If you could not return her affection, you should have gone away at once. But I believe that you have stayed for the sole and cruel purpose of gloating over her suffering." she has not suffered more than my friend or than i would if you indeed the idea of your suffering from any such cause i half believe you came here with a deliberate purpose of avenging your friend and that you are keeping for his inspection a diary in which the poor girl's humiliation to-day will form the hateful climax they did not dream that the one most interested was near miss van tyne had felt too faint and sorely wounded to go further without rest believing that the rocks would hide her from those whose eyes she would most wish to shun she had thrown herself down beyond the angle and was shedding the bitterest tears that she had ever known suddenly she heard mrs alston's words but a short distance away and was so overcome by their import that she hesitated what to do she would not meet them again for the world but felt so weak that she doubted whether she could drag herself away without being discovered especially as the beach trended off to the left so sharply a little further on that they might discover her while she was looking vainly for some way of escape she heard ackland's words and mrs alston's surmise in reply that he had come with the purpose of revenge she was so stung by their apparent truth that she resolved to clamber up through an opening of the rocks if the thing were possible panting and exhausted she gained the summit and then hastened to an adjacent grove as some wounded timid creature would run to the nearest cover ackland had heard sounds and had stepped around the point of the rocks just in time to see her disappearing above the bank returning to mrs alston he said impatiently in view of your opinions my society can have no attractions for you shall i accompany you to the hotel no was the angry reply i am in no mood to speak to you again to-day he merely bowed and turned as if to pursue his walk the moment she was hidden, however, he also climbed the rocks in time to see Miss Van Tyne entering the grove. With swift and silent tread he followed her, but could not at once discover her hiding place. At last passionate sobs made it evident that she was concealed behind a great oak a little on his left. Approaching cautiously, he heard her moan. "'Oh, this is worse than death. He makes me feel as if even God had no mercy for me.' but i will expiate my wrong i will at the bitterest sacrifice which a woman can make she sprang up to meet ackland standing with folded arms before her she started violently and leaned against the tree for support but the weakness was momentary for she wiped the tears from her eyes and then turned to him so quietly that only her extreme pallor proved that she realized the import of her words mr ackland she asked have you mr munson's address it was his turn now to start but he merely answered yes do do you think he still cares for me undoubtedly since then you are so near a friend will you write to him that i will try she turned away and would not look at him as after a moment's hesitation she concluded her sentence i will try to make him as happy as i can do you regret your course he asked with a slight tremor in his voice i regret that i misled that i wronged him beyond all words i am willing to make all amends in my power do you love him she now turned wholly away and shook her head and yet you would marry him yes if he wished it knowing all the truth can you believe that he would wish it he asked indignantly can you believe that any man then avenge him to your cruel soul's content she exclaimed passionately tell him that i have no heart to give to him or to any one through no effort or fault of mine i overheard mrs alston's words and yours i know your design against me ask which your friend's grief by assuring him of your entire success of which you are already so well aware tell him how you triumphed over an untaught thoughtless girl who was impelled merely by the love of power and excitement as you are governed by ambition and a remorseless will i did not know i did not understand how cruel i was although now that i do know i shall never forgive myself but if you had the heart of a man you might have seen that you were subjecting me to torture 
I did not ask or expect that you should care for me, but I had a right to hope for a little kindness, a little manly and delicate consideration, a little healing sympathy for the almost mortal wound that you have made. But now I see that you have stood by and watched like a grand inquisitor. Tell your friend that you have transformed the thoughtless girl into a suffering woman. I cannot go to Brazil. I cannot face dangers that might bring rest. I must keep my place in society, keep it too under a hundred observant and curious eyes. You have seen it all of late in this house. I was too wretched to care. It was a part of my punishment, and I accepted it. I would not be false again, even in trying to conceal a secret which is like death to a woman to reveal. I only craved one word of kindness from you. Had I received it, I would have gone away in silence and suffered in silence. But your course and what I have heard made me reckless and despairing. You do not leave me even the poor consolation of self-sacrifice." you are my stony-hearted fate i wish you had left me to drown tell your friend that i am more wretched than he ever can be because i am a woman will he be satisfied he ought to be was the low husky reply are you proud of your triumph no i am heartily ashamed of it but i have kept a pledge that will probably cost me far more than it has you a pledge yes my pledge to make you suffer as far as possible as he suffered she put her hand to her side as if she had received a wound, and after a moment said wearily and coldly, "'Well, tell him that you succeeded, and be content.' And she turned to leave him. "'Stay,' he cried impetuously. "'It is now your turn. Take your revenge.' "'My revenge?' she repeated in unfeigned astonishment. "'Yes, your revenge. I have loved you from the moment I hoped you had a woman's heart, yes, and before, when I feared I might not be able to save your life.' I know it now, though the very thought of it enraged me then. I have watched and waited more to be sure that you had a woman's heart than for aught else, though a false sense of honor kept me true to my pledge. After I met you on the beach, I determined at once to break my odious bond and place myself at your mercy. You may refuse me in view of my course. You probably will. But every one in that house there shall know that you refused me, and your triumph shall be more complete than mine." she looked into his face with an expression of amazement and doubt but instead of coldness there was now a devotion and pleading that she had never seen before she was too confused and astounded however to comprehend his words immediately nor could the impression of his hostility pass away readily you are mocking me she faltered scarcely knowing what she said i cannot blame you that you think me capable of mocking the noble candor which has cost you so dear as i can now understand I cannot ask you to believe that I appreciate your heroic impulse of self-sacrifice, your purpose to atone for wrong by inflicting irreparable wrong on yourself. It is natural that you should think of me only as an instrument of revenge with no more feeling than some keen-edged weapon would have. This also is the inevitable penalty of my course. When I speak of my love, I cannot complain if you smile in bitter incredulity but i have at least proved that i have a resolute will and that i keep my word and i again assure you that it shall be known this very night that you have refused me that i offered you my hand that you already had my heart where your image is enshrined with that of my mother and that i entreated you to be my wife my cousin alone guessed my miserable triumph all shall know of yours as he spoke with impassioned earnestness the confusion passed from her mind she felt the truth of his words she knew that her ambitious dream had been fulfilled and that she had achieved the conquest of a man upon whom all others had smiled in vain but how immeasurably different were her emotions from those which she had once anticipated not her beauty not her consummate skill and fascination had wrought this miracle but her woman's heart awakened at last and it thrilled with such unspeakable joy that she turned away to hide its reflex in her face he was misled by the act into believing that she could not forgive him and yet was perplexed when she murmured with a return of her old piquant humor you are mistaken mr ackland it shall never be known that i refused you how can you prevent it if your words are sincere you will submit to such terms as i choose to make i am sincere and my actions shall prove it but i shall permit no mistaken self-sacrifice on your part nor any attempt to shield me from the punishment i well deserve she suddenly turned upon him a radiant face in which he read his happiness and faltered jack i do believe you although the change seems wrought by some heavenly magic but it will take a long time to pay you up i hope to be your dear torment for a lifetime he caught her in such a strong impetuous embrace that she gasped 
I thought you were cold to our sex. It's not your sex that I am clasping, but you, my Eve, like the first man I have won my bride under the green trees and beneath the open sky. Yes, Jack, and I give you my whole heart as truly as did the first woman when there was but one man in all the world. That is my revenge. This is what Will Munson wrote some weeks later. Well, Jack, I've had the yellow fever, and it was the most fortunate event of my life. I was staying with a charming family, and they would not permit my removal to a hospital. One of my bravest and most devoted nurses has consented to become my wife. I hope you punished that little wretch, Eva Van Tyne, as she deserved. Confound your fickle soul, muttered Ackland. I punished her as she did not deserve, and I risked more than life in doing so. If her heart had not been as good as gold and as kind as heaven, she never would have looked at me again. Ackland is quite as indifferent to the sex as ever, but Eva has never complained that he was cold to her. End of an Unexpected Result Read by Like Many Waters An Unfinished Race by Ambrose Bierce This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman An Unfinished Race From Presence at a Hanging and Other Ghost Stories by Ambrose Bierce James Byrne Warson was a shoemaker who lived in Leamington, Warwickshire, England. He had a little shop in one of the byways leading off the road to Warwick. In his humble sphere, he was estimated an honest man, although, like many of his class in English towns, he was somewhat addicted to drink. When in liquor, he would make foolish wagers. On one of these two frequent occasions, he was boasting of his prowess as a pedestrian and athlete and the outcome was a match against nature. For the sake of one sovereign, he undertook to run all the way to Coventry and back, a distance of something more than forty miles. This was on the third day of September, in 1873. He set out at once. The man with whom he had made the bet, whose name is not remembered, accompanied by Barham Wise, a linen draper, and Hammerson Burns, a photographer, I think, following in a light cart or wagon. For several miles, Warrison went on very well, at an easy gait, without apparent fatigue, for he had really great powers of endurance and was not sufficiently intoxicated to enfeeble them. The three men in the wagon kept a short distance in the rear, giving him an occasional friendly chuff or encouragement as the spirit moved them. Suddenly, in the middle of the roadway, not a dozen yards from them, and with their eyes full upon him, the man seemed to stumble, pitched headlong forward, uttered a terrible cry, and vanished. He did not fall to the earth. He vanished before touching it. No trace of him was ever discovered. After remaining at and about the spot for some time, with aimless irresolution, the three men returned to Lemington, told their astonishing story, and were afterward taken into custody. But they were of good standing, had always been considered truthful, were sober at the time of the occurrence, and nothing ever transpired to discredit their sworn account of their extraordinary adventure, concerning the truth of which, nevertheless, public opinion was divided throughout the United Kingdom. If they had something to conceal, their choice of means was certainly one of the most amazing ever made by sane human beings. The End of The Unfinished Race by Ambrose Bierce The Wasted Gift, or Just a Minute, from Mrs. Whittlesey's Magazine for Mothers and Daughters, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Patterson. 
whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. Ecclesiastes 9.10 Dear mother, said little Emily Manvers, as she turned over the leaves of an elegant annual which he had just received, is not Uncle Albert very kind to send me this beautiful book? I wonder sometimes that he gives me such costly presents, but I suppose it's because he sees me so careful of my gifts. Mrs. Manvers smiled. That speech sounds rather egotistic, my dear. Do you really think you are such a very careful little girl? I am sure, mother, replied Emily, coloring slightly, that I take more care of my things than many other girls I know. There is my wax doll, I have had three years, and she is not even soiled, and that handsome paint box uncle gave me a year ago this Christmas is in as good order as ever. Though I have used it a great deal, there is not one paint lost or broken, and the brushes and crayons are all safe and perfect. That is as it should be, my daughter, returned Mrs. Manvers, for even in small things we should use our gifts as not abusing them. But what will you say when I tell you that you possess a treasure of inestimable value, which you often misuse sadly and neglect most heedlessly, a gift that properly employed will procure wonderful privileges, but which I sometimes fear you will never learn to value until you are about to lose it forever. Why, mother, what can you mean? exclaimed Emily in astonishment. It can't be that costly fan cousin Henry sent me from India. That was broken when I laid it down just a minute. Instead of putting it immediately away, or do you mean my pet dove that I sometimes have not a minute's time to feed in the morning? You cannot surely think that I will let it starve. No, Emily, answered the mother. It is something far more precious than either, although by your own admission you have two gifts of which you are not at all careful. But I fear that if I tell you what the treasure is, I shall fail in making you see clearly how much you misuse it. I will therefore keep a little memorandum of your neglect and ill usage of it for one week, and that I hope will make you more careful in the future. I will begin on Monday, as tomorrow being the Sabbath, I have this gift of yours more under my immediate care. Emily wondered very much what this wonderful treasure could be that she used so badly, and puzzled her brain the whole evening in guessing, but her mother told her to have patience and in a week she would find out. Emily Manvers was a kind, amiable little girl, between ten and eleven years old. She was dutiful and obedient, but had an evil habit of procrastination, which her mother had tried in vain to overcome. It was always time enough with Emily to do everything, and consequently her lessons were frequently imperfect and her wardrobe in a sad state. As Mrs. Manvers insisted upon her daughter sewing on strings and hooks and eyes when they were wanting, thus endeavoring to instill early habits of neatness, put not off till tomorrow what should be done today, was a copy the little girl frequently wrote, but she never allowed its meaning to sink into her heart. It was this truth which her mother hoped now to teach her. On Monday morning, Emily jumped up as soon as her mother called her, and seated herself on a low stool to put on her shoes and stockings. There was a story book lying upon the table, and as her eyes fell on it, she began to think over all the stories it contained, some of them quite silly ones, I'm sorry to say, and pulling her nightdress over her feet, sat thinking about worse than nothing until her mother opened the bedroom door and exclaimed in surprise what not dressed yet emily it is full fifteen minutes since i called you i will be dressed directly mother she said jumping up quite ashamed and she hurriedly put on her clothes brushed her hair and prepared for breakfast after breakfast she had to look over her lessons 
but remembering her mother's remarks she stole a few minutes to feed her doves and then hurried to school afraid of being late on her return home in the afternoon her mother told her to mend her gloves which she had torn emily went to her work basket but could not find her thimble where can my thimble be she cried after looking two or three minutes for it oh i remember now i left it on the window sill and off she ran to get it she was gone some time and on her return her mother asked couldn't you find your thimble emily yes mamma but james and george were flying their kites so i stopped just a minute to look at them i will sit down now she opened her work box and took out a needle then looking about said why where is my cotton spool i left it on a chair a minute ago she moved the chairs turned up the hearth rug and tumbled over her work box in vain the cotton could not be found presently she espied puss under the sofa busily employed tossing something about with her paw oh you naughty kitty you have got my spool cried emily as she stooped down and caught hold of the thread which puss had entangled about the sofa legs but kitty was in a playful mood and would not give up the cotton spool at once so emily amused herself playing with the cat and thread for some time longer at last she remembered her gloves and sitting down mended them in a few moments had emily's mother told her that she looked at her watch when the little girl first went for the thimble and that she had passed exactly three-quarters of an hour in idleness she would not have credited it after a while mrs manvers sent emily upstairs to get something for her she stayed so long that her mother called emily what keeps you so nothing mamma i stopped just a minute to look at my new sash it is so pretty ten minutes more were added to the wasted time the next day emily came home from school without any ticket for punctuality how is this asked the mother you started from home in good time yes mother returned the little girl but i stopped just a minute to speak to sarah randall and i know our school clock must be wrong for it was half past nine by it when i went in mrs manvers took the trouble to walk around the school and compare her watch with a clock they agreed exactly and thus she found her daughter had wasted half an hour that morning do you know your lessons emily she asked after her return as the little girl had been sitting for more than an hour with her books upon her lap not quite mother have you been studying all the time my dear pretty near there was a man beating his horse dreadfully and i just looked out of the window a minute mrs manvers smiled and yet sighed for she knew that emily had spent half an hour humming a tune and gazing idly from the window upon the passers-by that evening a little schoolmate came to visit her they played several amusing games and emily stayed up much past her usual hour the next morning when her mother called her she felt very sleepy and unwilling to rise so instead of jumping up at once she turned her head on the pillow thinking i will get up in a minute but in less than that minute she was fast asleep again and did not awake until aroused by mary the nurse whose voice sounded close in her ear exclaiming why miss emily are you in bed yet here have i been looking all through the house and garden for you jump up quick breakfast is just over you may be sure emily did not wait a second bidding but hurrying on her clothes hastened downstairs without even thinking about saying her prayers which no little child should ever forget to do because it is the kind and merciful god who keeps us safely through the night and our first thoughts when we awaken should be gratitude to him for protecting us and we should pray to him 
to keep us all day out of sin and danger and teach us how to improve the time which he has entrusted to our care emily thought of none of these things but ran down to the breakfast room feeling rather ashamed of being so late her papa had finished his breakfast and gone out when her mother looked up to the clock as she entered she saw that it wanted twenty minutes to nine how very late is it thought the little girl as she hurried off to school mamma always calls me at seven i did not think i had slept so long despite all emily's haste she was too late school had commenced when she entered and worse than all she did not know her lessons and was kept in an hour after the rest were dismissed she could not study the evening before and had depended upon an hour's study before breakfast but her unlucky morning nap left her no time to think about lessons before school and her consequent disgrace was the punishment the little girl returned home that day very unhappy emily had not forgotten the conversation about the wasted gift and had determined to give no opportunity for her mother to complain she thought she was very careful that week but never imagined how much of the precious gift she wasted each day in idleness the day after her unfortunate disgrace in school she brought down several articles of dress that needed repairing and seated herself at the window to work her mother had promised to take her out with her and emily had finished her mending first she plied the needle very steadily for a while but presently her attention was attracted by the opposite neighbors look mamma she exclaimed there is mrs dodson and lucy they are just going out and lucy has on a new hat well my dear returned her mother quietly it is not unusual for people to get new bonnets at this season emily felt a little abashed at this reply but could not refrain from casting furtive glances across the way the afternoon was fine and the street was filled with well-dressed people the little girl watched the passers-by holding her needle listlessly in her fingers and presently cried out did you see that lady mamma how oddly she was dressed no answered mrs manvers i am attending to my work now but i hope soon to join the promenaders myself emily stole a glance at her mother to see whether her countenance implied reproof but mrs manvers's eyes were fixed upon her work and the little girl again endeavored to fix her attention upon her sewing at length mrs manvers rose and put aside her work basket i am going to dress emily she said very well mother i will be ready in a minute replied her daughter and she followed her mother upstairs emily tossed over her bureau in vain to find a clean pair of pantalets and then she remembered of having taken several pairs downstairs to mend she ran hastily down and selected the best pair some of the buttonholes were torn out but she could not wait to mend them now so hastily pinning on the pantalets she dressed and joined her mother as they pursued their walk emily felt something about her feet and looking down discovered her pantalets she hastily stooped to pull them off and the pin scratched her foot severely mrs manvers saw all this but said nothing she knew that her daughter had wasted time enough to have mended all her pantalets and she added another hour to the already long account of wasted minutes in her memorandum the following day was friday and it was part of emily's duties on this day to arrange her bureau drawers and put her closet in order she went upstairs after dinner with this intention but there were so many little gifts and keepsakes in her drawers to be successfully admired and thought over so many sashes to unfold and odd gloves to be paired that the whole afternoon was consumed and the tea-bell rang before she had quite finished the second draw and consequently the duty of that day remained to be finished on the next well my little girl 
said her father the next morning. I hope you will have my handkerchief nicely hemmed by this afternoon. You have had it several days now, and I supposed it is nearly finished. I shall want it as I am going away after dinner. You shall have it, Papa, replied Emily. She did not like to tell him that the handkerchief was not yet commenced, as she felt quite sure she could finish it in time, and determined to begin immediately after breakfast. When she went upstairs to get the handkerchief out of the drawer, she saw her bureau was yet in disorder. Mama will be displeased to see this, she thought, and I shall have time enough to put it in order and hem Papa's handkerchief beside. She went eagerly to work, but the bureau took her longer than she anticipated, and when her father came home to dinner, she had not finished his handkerchief. Now she made her needle fly, but her industry came too late. Her father could not wait, and Emily had the mortification of hearing him say, I hope my handkerchief will not be like my gloves that you kept so long to mend, and Mama had to finish after all. She cried bitterly after he was gone, but managed through her tears to finish the handkerchief at last, and carried it to her mother, asking her to beg her Papa's forgiveness. After tea was over, Mrs. Manvers called Emily to her, and folding her arm fondly around the little girl's waist, pointed to a small book lying open upon the table, saying as she did so, Do you remember, my love, our conversation last Saturday night upon the subject of your gifts? Oh, yes, Mama, and you told me you would keep an account of my ill usage of one of them. I have done so, my dear, and now tell me, can you not imagine what this gift is which you so much abuse? Indeed, I cannot, Mamma, replied the little girl with a sigh. Mrs. Manvers placed the memorandum book in her daughter's hand without saying a word. There, written at the head of the page, were these words, Emily's Waste of Time and beneath was quite a long column of figures and a list of duties unfulfilled. Oh, Mama, cried Emily, throwing herself upon her mother's breast. It is time, precious time. That is the gift I waste, but surely I have not spent so many idle minutes in just one week. I am sorry to say that you have, my dear daughter. All these, and even more, I have promised to keep an account, and I have done so. Add them up and see how many there are. Emily added up the figures with tearful eyes and said, There are four hundred and twenty, Mama. And how many hours does that make, Emily? The little girl thought a moment and then answered, Seven hours. Very well. Then you see you've wasted seven hours in a week, which could make 364 in a year. And if you should live the allotted period of life, which would be 60 years from the present time, you will willfully waste 21,840 hours of precious time God has given you in which to work out his will. Oh, dear mama, it does not seem possible, I am sure. I don't know how the time slips away, said Emily sadly. I will tell you, my love, replied Mrs. Manvers. It slips away in just a minute. As uncounted drops of water form the sea, so do millions of minutes make up the sum of life, but so small are they that they pass without our heeding them. Yet once gone, they come back to us no more. Time is the one talent, the precious gift, which God has bestowed upon all his creatures, and which we are bound to improve. Every hour brings its duty. And do you think it is right, Emily, to leave that duty unfulfilled? Emily hung her head, while tears slowly coursed down her cheek. Do you not see, my dear, that by idling away the precious moments, you crowd the duty of one hour into the next? so your task can never be finished, or at best, very imperfectly. 
if you reflect the experience of the past week will tell you this i have kept this memorandum on purpose to convince you of your sinful waste of the most precious of all gifts the time which our master allows us here to work out our happiness hereafter remember my love that you are accountable to him for your use of his gifts and a proper improvement of time will not only save you many mortifications and produce much pleasure and comfort to yourself and all about you but it is a duty you owe to god who bestowed it do not think me unnecessarily earnest my dear little girl the subject is of fearful importance and this habit of putting off till to-morrow what should be done to-day is your greatest fault remember hereafter that whatsoever thine hand findeth to do do it now with all thy might and then i shall have no more occasion to remind you of the wasted gift emily never forgot the lesson of that week but gradually overcame the evil habits of idleness and procrastination which were becoming fixed before she was made fully aware of their danger and a long life of usefulness attested the good impression left upon her mind by her mother's memorandum of the wasted gift end of the wasted gift or just a minute from mrs whittlesey's magazine for mothers and daughters Volume 3「When I Was Dead」by Vincent O'Sullivan And yet my heart will not confess he owes the malady that doth my life besiege. All's well that ends well. That was the worst of Ravenall Hall. The passages were long and gloomy, the rooms were musty and dull, even the pictures were sombre and their subjects dire. On an autumn evening, when the wind sighed and wailed through the trees in the park, and the dead leaves whistled and chattered while the rain clamoured at the windows, small wonder that folks with gentle nerves went astraying in their wits. An acute nervous system is a grievous burthen on the deck of a yacht under sunlit skies. At Ravenall, the chain of nerves was prone to clash and jangle a funeral march. Nerves must be pampered in a tea-drinking community, and the ghost that your grandfather, with a skinful of port, could face and never tremble, sets you in your sobriety sweating and shivering, or, becoming scared, poor ghost of your bulged eyes and dropping jaw, he quenches expectation by not appearing at all. So I am left to conclude that it was tea which made my acquaintance afraid to stay at Ravenall. Even Wilvern gave over, and as he is in the guards and a polo player, his nerves ought to be strong enough. On the night before he went, I was explaining to him my theory that if you place some drops of human blood near you and then concentrate your thoughts, you will, after a while, see before you a man or woman who will stay with you during long hours of the night and even meet you at unexpected places during the day. I was explaining this theory, I repeat, when he interrupted me with words, senseless enough, which sent me fencing and parrying strangers, on my guard. "'I say, Alistair, my dear chap,' he began, "'you ought to get out of this place and go up to town and knock about a bit. You really ought, you know.' "'Yes,' I replied, "'and get poisoned at the hotels by bad food "'and at the clubs by bad talk, I suppose. "'No, thank you, and let me say that your care for my health enervates me.' "'Well, you can do as you like,' says he, "'rapping with his feet on the floor. "'I'm hanged if I stay here after tomorrow. "'I'll be staring mad if I do.' "'He was my last visitor. "'Some weeks after his departure "'I was sitting in the library with my drops of blood by me. I had got my theory nearly perfect by this time, but there was one difficulty. The figure which I had ever before me was the figure of an old woman with her hair divided in the middle, and her hair fell to her shoulders, white on one side and black on the other. She was a very complete old woman, but alas, she was eyeless, and when I tried to construct the eyes she would shrivel and rot in my sight. But to-night I was thinking, thinking as I had never thought before, and the eyes were just creeping into the head 
when I heard a terrible crash outside, as if some heavy substance had fallen. Of a sudden the door was flung open, and two maidservants entered. They glanced at the rug under my chair, and at that they turned a sick white, cried on God, and huddled out. "'How dare you enter the library in this manner?' I demanded sternly. No answer came back from them, so I started in pursuit. I found all the servants in the house gathered in a knot at the end of the passage. "'Mrs. Pebble,' I said smartly to the housekeeper, "'I want those two women discharged to-morrow. It's an outrage. You ought to be more careful.' But she was not attending to me. Her face was distorted with terror. "'Ah, dear! Ah, dear!' she went. "'We had better all go to the library together,' says she to the others. "'Am I master of my own house, Mrs. Pebble?' I inquired, bringing my knuckles down with a bang on the table. None of them seemed to see me or hear me. I might as well have been shrieking in a desert. I followed them down the passage, and forbade them to enter the library. But they trooped past me, and stood with a clutter round the hearthrug. Then three or four of them began dragging out and lifting, as if they were lifting a helpless body, and stumbled with their imaginary burthen over to a sofa. Old Soames the butler stood near. "'Poor young gentleman,' he said with a sob. "'I've known him since he was a baby, and to think of him being dead like this, and so young, too!' I crossed the room. "'What's all this, Soames?' I cried, shaking him roughly by the shoulders. "'I'm not dead! I'm here! Here!' As he did not stir, I got a little scared. "'Soames, old friend!' I called. "'Don't you know me? Don't you know the little boy you used to play with? Say I'm not dead, Soames! Please, Soames!' He stooped down and kissed the sofa. "'I think one of the men ought to ride over to the village for the doctor, Mr. Soames,' said Mrs. Pebble, and he shuffled out to give the order. Now this doctor was an ignorant dog, whom I had been forced to exclude from the house because he went about proclaiming his belief in a saving God, at the same time that he proclaimed himself a man of science. He, I was resolved, should never cross my threshold, and I followed Mrs. Pebble through the house, screaming out prohibition. But I did not catch even a groan from her, not a nod of the head, nor a cast of the eye, to show that she had heard. I met the doctor at the door of the library. "'Well,' I sneered, throwing my hand in his face, "'have you come to teach me some new prayers?' He brushed by me as if he had not felt the blow, and knelt down by the sofa. "'Rupture of a vessel on the brain, I think,' he says to Soames and Mrs. Pebble after a short moment. "'He has been dead some hours. Poor fellow! You had better telegraph for his sister, and I will send up the undertaker to arrange the body.' "'You liar!' I yelled. "'You whining liar!' "'How have you the insolence to tell my servants that I am dead "'when you see me here face to face?' "'He was far in the passage, with Soames and Mrs. Pebble at his heels, "'ere I had ended, and not one of the three turned round. "'All that night I sat in the library. "'Strangely enough, I had no wish to sleep, "'nor during the time that followed had I any craving to eat. "'In the morning the men came, and although I ordered them out, "'they proceeded to minister about something I could not see.' So all day I stayed in the library, or wandered about the house, and at night the men came again, bringing with them a coffin. Then, in my humour, thinking it shame that so fine a coffin should be empty, I lay the night in it, and slept a soft, dreamless sleep, the softest sleep I have ever slept. And when the men came the next day I rested still, and the undertaker shaved me. A strange valet. On the evening after that I was coming downstairs, when I noted some luggage in the hall, and so learned that my sister had arrived. I had not seen this woman since her marriage, and I loathed her more than I loathed any creature in this ill-organized world. She was very beautiful, I think, tall and dark and straight as a ramrod, and she had an unruly passion for scandal and dress. I suppose the reason I disliked her so intensely was that she had a habit of making one aware of her presence when she was several yards off. At half-past nine o'clock, my sister came down to the library in a very charming wrap, and I soon found that she was as insensible to my presence as the others. I trembled with rage to see her kneel down by the coffin, my coffin, but when she bent over to kiss the pillow, I threw away control. A knife which had been used to cut string was lying upon a table. I seized it and drove it into her neck. She fled from the room, screaming. 
Come, come, she cried, her voice quivering with anguish. The corpse is bleeding from the nose. Then I cursed her. On the evening of the third day, there was a heavy fall of snow. About eleven o'clock, I observed that the house was filled with blacks and mutes and folk of the county, who came for the obsequies. I went into the library and sat still and waited. Soon came the men, and they closed the lid of the coffin and bore it out on their shoulders. And yet I sat, feeling rather sadly that something of mine had been taken away. I could not quite think what. For half an hour, perhaps, dreaming, dreaming, and then I glided to the hall door. There was no trace left of the funeral, but after a while I sighted a black thread winding slowly across the white plain. "'I'm not dead!' I moaned, and rubbed my face in the pure snow, and tossed it on my neck and hair. "'Sweet God, I am not dead!' End of When I Was Dead by Vincent O'Sullivan